Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for our very first Seal Connect Classroom webinar. We launched this series to help train and educate personnel on the plant floor, distributors, and equipment manufacturers. This webinar series will have monthly classes on the second Tuesday of each month, and uh, it will focus on reliability, maintenance, and of course, proper sealing. We will invite experts from across the industry to join us each month to help ensure that all personnel have the skills they need for success. Um, before we get started with the actual presentation today, we want to um, uh, take care of a few housekeeping notes just to let you know um, that um, you can join the chat on social media using the hashtag Seal Connect. We encourage you to do that. Um, we um, will answer questions at the end of the webinar. There is a Q&A section, it just says questions, in the right-hand panel of the GoToWebinar app. And you can ask questions at any time during the webinar, and we will let Chuck answer those um, when we get finished. Uh, the slides are not in the resources section, as it says there, but we will email you the link um, with the recording of the webinar, because we are recording the webinar um in about 24 hours after um, we finish today and um, if you have any questions that are technical problems ask those in the question section as well and um, we'll um, answer those as quickly as we can hopefully everyone's hearing us and um, we have with us today chuck tanner who is a 30-year maintenance and reliability veteran uh, working a lot in the pulp and paper industry and um, he is a wealth of knowledge and we're super happy to have him and uh, Chuck before we get started we will make sure folks have time to get into the webinar before we begin and um, I um, want to ask you what is the toughest or strangest packing issue that you've seen in your um, storied career in pulp and paper or just in Indian any industry Thanks, Laurie. Uh, thanks, thanks again for everybody joining us today. But uh, some of the, the toughest applications that I've seen in my career as far as packing uh, occur in the pulp and paper industry uh, and mostly in the pulping operations. Uh, the pulping operations have uh, some very specific high pressure, uh, severe caustic applications. Uh, we have it, we have had great experiences around the, the digester, critical equipment in the digester, such as the outlet device, the feeders, the top separators. And one of the really unique problematic areas that we, we've we've had over the years and all, all fluid sealing companies have had uh, limited success with is on the, uh, the high pressure liquor pumps. And uh, through a lot of experience, a lot of trial and error, we've, we've done a lot of development and research and, and, and resolved a lot of these problems with these, these particular pumps, pumping high liquor, such as you make up liquor and you're cooking liquor pumps around the digester. And uh, if anybody wants any, has any specific questions about that, they can uh, you know, contact our staff here and we'd be glad to address those for them. But uh, that's some have been some of the toughest applications we've seen as far as packing and severe duty services. Okay, um, and yes, at the end of the webinar, your email address and um, other info will be available, your contact info, so um, keep that in mind if you have any questions about those applications that Chuck just mentioned. And Chuck, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the way and let you uh, move forward. And um, also remember, this is our very first webinar, so if there are any technical issues, y'all just forgive us a little bit. And um, Chuck, take it away. Okay, thanks, Laurie. Uh, some of the things we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about actually what compression packing is and where it lives in a pump and valve. And uh, we're going to talk about stuffing box reliability and why that's important. Some some detailed inspection things that you may want to do when you uh, uh, do some repacking so you don't reinstall some of the same problems. We're going to talk about properly cutting packing rings and fabrication of rings. And we're going to talk about some installation procedures and some some detailed steps involving installations that we found to be very helpful over the years. And uh, then we have a little question and answer session at the end. Uh, Laurie, we, we got a poll coming up. Uh, do you mind launching that poll and so, so, so the listeners can can uh, 
tell you some things that they may be a concern to them. Of course, um, we definitely want to um, find out um, what are some major problems that you've had. So we're gonna launch this poll and um, you can pick up to three problems. Um, so let us know what you think. And uh, there we go, it is launched. You can answer, we'll give you um, about a minute to, to let us know what you're thinking. And um, definitely um, give us your answers as much as, um, as much as you can. We've got a good number of answers coming in. We're gonna give it another few seconds. And we're still getting some stuff coming in. All right, it looks like we've slowed down. So we're gonna close the poll and I'm gonna share the results. So 68% of folks, Chuck, say excess leakage, um, 53 difficulty installing, um, 63% problem selecting the right packing and 26% uh, cutting and 16% other. So it looks like the, the three top ones are excess leakage, installation issues, which you are absolutely going to help with today, and um, packing selection. So um, know that we will probably do another webinar on packing selection coming up. So um, we'll, uh, we'll make sure we um, try to help you all with these issues. All right, Chuck, it should be back to you. You'll have to pop back okay. into presentation. Uh, let me go back where I'm supposed to be. Yep. Okay. There we go. And we need to go back into presentation mode. From, from current slide. There we go. Yep. Okay. Awesome. You are good. All right. All right. Let's talk a little bit about what compression packing is. Uh, some some of the folks attending they may not even really know what it is. Compression packing is still one of the most most prevalent and the oldest uh, fluid sealing devices throughout industry used today. I mean, you know, mechanical seals has taken a fair share of that, but there's just some applications that it's just more cost effective and it's more of a, of a reliable solution uh, to run packing. Some equipment is just too prohibitive to tear down to change seals and uh, packing is still that, that go-to uh, fluid sealing device. And basically what you're doing with the set of packing is you're, you're installing a, a number of rings inside of a stuffing box and you're exerting a gland load onto that, that packing and expanding it radially. And there's two things what packing does. Packing functions as two devices in the stuffing box. It functions as a dynamic seal along the shaft uh, and sealing a, a, a dynamic surface but also on the OD, the packing functions like a gasket and it seals the bore of the box to, to keep the fluids from, from migrating around the bore of the box. So if you have gland leakage on the OD and you have OD packing leakage, be sure to check and make sure you got the right size packing there in the stuffing box. But the packing it is basically consists of uh, braided yarns that has built in lubricants and those lubricants are blocking agents to keep fluids from wicking through the fibers. And as you compress the packing, those blocking, those blocking agents and the lubricants are expelled out of the packing from the yarns, helps lubricate that shaft. And once you compress the packing and the gland follower to its maximum percentage, that percentage of the stuffing box, the gland follower knows is usually 30% of the depth. Once that is totally compressed, is a standard rule, that's the percentage of lubricants that's left in the packing. The packing is spent and needs to be replaced. So there's, we talked a little bit about lubricating films from the packing and there's, there's, source, there's three sources of lubricating films from packing. Uh, there's lubricants, of course, that we braid in the packing that we provide internally in the packing. Uh, as far as the, 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 you see the packing, it's got the grease and graphite coatings or it's got a, uh, a white Teflon looking coating. Those are internal lubricants there. And uh, most companies also put a, a break-in lube and a pressurize a break-in lube in addition to that. So that lubricating film also comes from products being pumped. In other words, if you've got a clean, there's two things you need to remember about whether it's uh, seals or packing. 
you, at the dynamic surface, you want to keep that surface cool and keep it clean, okay? So if you've got a product that uh, is a fairly clean product, those products provide a lubricating film. So you need two sources of lubricants to be successful. You see, we, we give you the internal lubricants. You can either get that lubricant from, from the pr pr product that's pumped if it's a fairly clean product, or you're required to use an external flush. And we're gonna talk a little bit about external flushes. So the external flush in slurry applications provides a lubricating film for the packing. So that gives you another source of lubricating film if the product is a slurry. So you've got internal lubricants, product being pumped, and external flush is lubricating sources for your packing. And to be successful and have a good, reliabil good reliability out of your packing, in, in rotating equipment, you have got to you have two of these criteria met to be successful. So, in all slurries applications, you must use a flush because you, you have uh, the the pump pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure. So, if you don't use an external flush the solids and the abrasives and, and abrasive services will migrate back into your packing set. And those abrasives will embed in your packing set and become a grinding wheel. Well, that grinding also displaces the metals on the shaft sleeve. Those metals are deposited in your packing also, so your packing becomes very, very abrasive. So this external flush needs to be 15 to 20 PSI above above the maximum stuffing box pressure. So that's really important that you know that because some some processes, they may run the piece of equipment against a throttled head. And so your flush pressure may elevate in some extreme situations. So you gotta be very careful when you set up flush water to, to know how those people are gonna operate that piece of equipment to make sure that you, you set the flush pressure to the place where it's, it's, it's extreme. So, this is how we recommend you set up packing in slurry services. We recommend you use an external flush. There's nothing, there's no magic device, and there's nothing you can put in the bottom of that stuffing box to keep the solids from migrating back in your packing set because you've got, you'll have a higher pressure in your stuffing box than you will atmospheric pressure. So you've got a constant battle that's migrating. So what this, this, external flush does, it provides a clean, cool, fluid film for the packing to run on. Uh, and remember, you, you gotta keep those surfaces cool and clean. So that that gives you that, that extra external source of lubrication. Some services you can run uh, flushless. It's perfectly acceptable to do that. And most most people use some form of flexible graphite product to run flushless or some carbon yarn type product, something, some product that, and we're gonna talk about this sometime during the, the, prep, the product selection uh, videos, but some, you want to use a product that has good thermal conductivity. So as a general rule, if you'll pick a product that has a good feet per minute rating, a good speed rating, you, you can run it flushless in clean services. But, uh, but never, never, never try to run these products in solids or slurries without that external flush because uh, you, you end up with severe equipment damage. Here's a typical cutaway of a pump for those people that, kind of, that may be new that don't, uh, that don't know, you know the basic anatomy of a stuffing box. Uh, we'll start from left to right. Of course, you got your shaft. All equipment looks similar to this, whether it's an agitator, a mixer, or a pump, or a, or you know maybe a double-ended pump. You got two stuffing boxes, but you just have to. This gives you an idea of what the pump looks like on the inside. Of course, you got a shaft or a shaft sleeve. The gland itself is what's used to, to exert mechanical load on the packing to get it to expand. The next item you see in there, is some of the packing. Then you see the lantern ring, that's the port that we use. It's got a series of holes in it that where you inject the flush water into to the shaft to, to lubricate the packing. Uh, there's your flush port on the outside there. That's where you, where you plumb up your external flush to get external water, some external lubricant in the, in the, in the stuffing box. 
and the stuffing box throat. What's really important to this as far as loading packing is the stuffing box throat and the back surface of that packing gland where it actually touches the surface of the packing. Some pieces of equipment have multiple flush port locations. It's really important when you do a repacking job that you know where those ports are, especially on some homemade equipment. Some There's a lot of stuff that's, that's, that's made plant specific that's not a production item that may, that people may not know exactly where the flush port is. If you're not sure where the flush port is, you need to you know take something and, and find where that port is in the stuffing box and, and, and measure that and, uh, and uh, locate that port and make you a hand drawing exactly where the packing goes. But be aware of where that port is, where that lantern ring is located, and so you get the proper flushing of your packing. And also be aware that that, that that lantern ring travels toward the process side as you apply a gland load. So over time, when you find that location of that port, be sure that when the packing is adjusted over time, you don't close the port with the rings behind the packing and shut your flush water off. But it's really important that you know where this port is and you pack it the proper way. Some of the nomenclature you're gonna see, see with customers in the field, the standard industry nomenclature, if you look at the top half of that drawing, we count the rings from the bottom of the stuffing box to the gland. That particular top drawing, we consider that a lantern ring five arrangement. The bottom half of that drawing, you see that it's a 2L3 arrangement, two lantern ring, three ring arrangement. So that's kind of some of the verbiage you'll see in the maintenance in the maintenance field when they refer to packing location, lantern, row, clay, lantern ring location in the field. Uh, let's talk about leaking. Compression packing must leak. It's either going to leak the product being pumped if the if the product is being ran flushless, or it's going to leak flush water. The key to packing is being able to, to close that leakage up without burning the packing up and get that leakage rate down to 10 to 12 drops per minute per inch of shaft size. That's just a standard industry rule for that. And it, it, it's achievable if you make the right product selection. And uh, like, like I refer, we referred to before, if you look at the speed ratings of the packing and use a product that has a really good shaft speed rating, this will allow you to tighten the packing up to the point where you can control that leakage without burning and glazing the packing. Factors you must consider for, for ultimate packing reliability. Uh, the selection process is something like Laurie said earlier, we're going to have some, some uh, webinars and discussing the actual selection process. And we, we, we try to get that down to something real simple. Uh, it's really daunting when you look at uh, people's packing catalogs. I mean, uh, uh, the particular company I represent, uh, we make uh, 700 different kinds of packing, but uh, we can make that make that selection process real simple for, for most users and, and most field representative, rep, representatives. So uh, that should be something we'll be able to take care of in the next video. We're going to talk today about installation. There's no substitute for good installations and good installation procedures. Uh, that's the, one of the key things that needs to be addressed if you want good reliability and, uh, and high standards equi equipment maintenance. I mean, you know, packing is not going to fix war sleeves. It's not going to fix war equipment. I mean, when you do repacking jobs in the field, you need to look at, you know, sleeve wear. You need to look at th stuffing box throat wear. You need to look at glands to make sure the glands are not corroded away. Those standards, you know, directly affect your reliability. Uh, things that just real briefly that y you may consider when you when you're looking at fiber compatibility, again, we look at speeds. In pumps, pressures are not really a big thing. The, the things about in rotating equipment, as far as pressures, you need to you need to look at uh, you know your flush water pressures. Product temperatures are not too bad in rotating equipment. You get into that when you talk about valve sealing, which is a really a whole other subject. And the product being sealed, you know, the, the, when you're looking at the product being sealed. 
what you're looking for is, you know, we talked about the yarns being a carrier for the lubricants. What you want is a yarn that has a good pH range. There's a lot of yarns that people braid today that were, you know, holdovers from the non-asbestos days and the converting from non-asbestos. But there's so many high-tech yarns available today that have 0 to 14 pH that are very cost effective that I try, when I personally try to select packing for a, for a user or myself, is I use something with a 0 to 14 pH. That way I don't have to worry about anything that, that's going to be used in that process that's going to cause uh, deterioration of the yarns. And I look at shaft speeds. I look at uh, the higher the, the shaft speed rating is on the yarns and the packing, the tighter you can run it and the more reliable the product will be. And, and the longevity will be a lot much greater if you run something with uh, a good high shaft speed. And that's pretty much in a nutshell what, what the selection process is all about. Let's talk about talk about installation now. Uh, first of all, before you install packing, you need to make sure you get the right size. And you're going to run in places where you're going to come up with these oddball cross sections and all sorts of different things like that. Uh, you can use the next size bigger, the next size smaller. Uh, it's better to go bigger than it is smaller in cross section, but it makes it difficult to put in. But basically the way you determine the cross section is you take the stuffing box bore minus the shaft sleeve and divide it by two. It's pretty simple, just basic math. Uh, to get the stuffing box bore, a little trick you can use is you can measure the OD of the gland follower to get the bore. And then, then kind of go up to the next nominal size because normally the gland follower will be just a few thousand smaller than the stuffing box bore. But that gives you the right size packing. And uh, one thing you'll find out through experience that there's really, if you get into metric sizes, there's really no substitute for metric sizes. Sometimes you can use some standard sizes to substitute for metric, but a lot of times you can't. Uh, you'll end up with packing too small, it'll leak on the OD of the bore, the, the uh, so you'll, you you won't be able to control the gland leakage if the packing's not tight enough. So if you need a metric size, insist that your supplier supply you a metric size to get a proper to get a proper fit and get proper reliability out of it. Let's talk about cutting rings. Cutting rings is really pretty simple. Uh, you know, some 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 users use guillotine cutters and all these sort of things. But one thing you got to remember about a packing ring: a packing ring is shorter on the inside and longer on the OD. So the only way to truly get a packing ring that will fit is to cut those rings on a mandrel. And you can get caught up on on making mandrels and doing all these sort of things. Uh, I mean, you can make mandrels on pipe, you can make mandrels on broomsticks if you want to. Uh, and basically all you need is a little duct tape. And what I try to do is when I make a mandrel, is I make the mandrel, it's real high tech, I make it one wrap bigger in duct tape than the actual sleeve size. And by doing that, you get a ring that's just a little bit longer. And that ring wants to fit, and the joints in the ring wants to fit a little bit tighter when you do that. So you make sure you don't have any gaps in the joint, and you get a really tight ring fit. But uh, I mean, making mandrels don't get hung up on 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 how to make mandrels and machining mandrels and all that sort of stuff. You can make make mandrels on pipe, broomsticks, steel rod, whatever you want to. In fact, this particular photograph is you know a mandrel that, that they use in our shop. And uh, uh, mandrels are a real simple thing to do. And the nice thing about using a mandrel is you 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 get the pro you cut the packing in a vise on a workbench in a nice safe position that you don't have to worry about any hand hand injuries. And uh, nobody wants to get cut cutting packing rings. So it's uh, uh and you can quality control what you cut before you go to the job. 
and it's uh, it will fit when you get there, and it's none of this laying it on the ground. Some of you guys have been around maintenance. There's no laying it on the pump base and taking somebody else's ring and trying to make a ring from somebody else's ring because you don't know whether that ring is the right size ring or not. So, and usually you have to cut three or four side three or four rings and waste all that pack and trying to determine what ring size it is. You get a much better fit and a, and a much better ring if you cut it on a mandrel. Let's see, I think I covered all these topics here. Let's talk about the packing. The packing itself, the Fluid Sealing Association, this is really important to remember, uh, the standard, but sizing from the Fluid Signal Association is the packing is not square. It's important you remember that. The packing is rectangular. It is in the cross section that it goes in the stuffing box. It's a 30 second smaller than the width. The width is 30 second wider and a 30 second smaller on the, on the cross section. You take the packing from the spool and you wrap it around the shaft the same way it go comes from the spool. And that gives you that 30 second difference in size. First thing you do, you'd be surprised at the number of people that can't skive cut rings. When you get we get done with this, this, this discussion, go out in your shop, make you a mandrel, take your piece of packing, and cut you some skive cut rings, some 45 degree cut rings. It's real simple. Once we go through this, this little presentation here, you'll be going to understand how we do it. You take one end of the packing and cut a 45 cut on it. You wrap the packing around the shaft like you'd see in this picture. It goes around the shaft just like it goes around this mandrel. You take your knife and lay it at the tip of your 45 degree cut. You make a parallel cut on the on the next piece next to it where you're gonna make make your joint and make your cut off the spool and you'll get perfectly cut skive cut rings every single time. And then again, you've got a mandrel there that you know that fits the piece of equipment you're packing. Wrap the packing around that mandrel and double check it. This will give you a ring that will properly fit a radius. You can't really do that when you lay packing flat and cut it. You can't get the ring to fit the radius of the ring of the of the uh, of the shaft. So it's much better if you cut the rings on a mandrel like this. You get a much more higher quality ring. Let's talk about cuts. You know, there's always this old adage about butt cuts and scythe cuts and and we don't really care how you cut it, whether you butt cut it or scythe cut it. Uh, the main thing about the packing and the joint is the, that the joint does not keystone open at the OD of the joint when you wrap it around that shaft and put it in the stuffing box. Because what you're dealing with with the packing is you got to have the box completely full and that material has density. If you leave gaps in the rings, there's no way to load the rings from the back of the gland to the bottom of the stuffing box because air has no density. So it's really important that you cut good tight rings when you when you uh, cut your rings. And we really doesn't matter to us how you cut them, if you butt cut them or scythe cut them, either way is acceptable. But uh, the illustration we showed you is how to cut scythe joints and it's kind of funny. Most people don't know how to cut scythe joints, and that's the reason they don't cut scythe joints. So it's a, it's a really pretty simple operation to cut them, and then, uh, it just makes a much neater joint. One other thing, if you're cutting some packing that uh, wants to kind of broom straw out or, or come apart on the ends, you can take those joints where you're going to make your cuts and wrap a piece of masking tape there around that joint and cut through that tape and install the ring with the tape on it. Don't take it off. It'll, it'll rub off pretty quickly when the pump starts. But you but you but if you cut that with through some tape and leave the tape on it, it uh, it'll keep your joints and keep your uh, ends from trying to fray while you're installing them. That's just a little tip that's not in this slide. Uh, let's talk about packing ring installation. Laura, we got another poll here, and uh, if you can take 
take care of this little housekeeping chore for us. We'd appreciate it. Yes, we do. So we just want to know, you know, when you're installing your rings, do you use special tools or whatever's around? So we're going to launch this and please answer and we'll give you a few seconds to do so. All right, we've got about 68, 70% of folks voting. I'll give you another couple seconds and then we'll see the results. And so far the results are exciting. All right, we're gonna close the poll. And excitingly enough, Chuck, 54% say they do use specialized tools, so that's exciting. 46% don't, so um, We'll um, we'll move forward, but thanks for answering that question for us. Okay. Uh, thanks, Laurie. Let's see here. I got to get back, yes, back to my slides. Hold on. I got no rush. We're good. I'll get to it here just a second. <laughs> Down the list. And before I mute my mic, the slides you're about to show. Once you're back into presentation mode. Go, go ahead, Laurie. I got it. Yeah, the um, there you go. This uh, infographic that you're going to discuss um, about being on our website, I did add it as a download under the handout section. If anyone wants to download it, it's right there for you. Okay, Laurie, thanks. Uh, this particular handout, uh, you know, this would be really great for some of you guys at uh, uh, in the maintenance field that's that's attending this uh, webinar. Uh, to have and maybe to, to print, to, to add to your work orders when, when guys go out and do repacking jobs. This is just a basic uh, reminder of things that you need to do when you do repacking jobs. And, and you know, uh, we hope that you don't do that many packing jobs and hope they need a little reminder to, to, do, some, to do, some, do some things along the way. But uh, this is a great little tool and we have several people using this and it it's, it's been, a, been a great little little tool for people to use. So it's, it's and like Laurie said, it's available on our website. You can download it and print it, print it and do what you want to with it. Put it on your shop wall. It'd be great. Thanks. Let's see here. Let's talk about, let's talk about remote, the packing process. So we got all the rings cut, we're ready to go pack a pump. First thing is you need to take all the packing out of the stuffing box and get anything that's in the stuffing box, you know, that the, my history with the, with the pulp and paper is, you know, you get paper stock that gets, get, that gets dried and gets in the bottom of the boxes and all sorts of things. So you need to get all that stuff out and get it clean. Uh, and you need to take all the packing out of the stuffing box. You know, sometimes you get in situations where you want to add rings to the outside, but be aware that you could have dewatered uh, product in the in the bottom rings and bed in the bottom rings in the stuffing box or you could have plugged lantern rings and you really don't know what you're going to get out of that except a bunch of sleeve wear so just be aware that it's best if you take all the rings out take the lantern rings out inspect the lantern rings if the lantern rings are bad replace them uh, lantern rings are cheap insurance but uh, uh, get everything out of the box and clean it so as far as inspection uh, of course, the obvious thing that everybody always inspects is a sleeve for sleeve wear. And uh, the stuffing box bore for corrosion in the throats to make sure, in the throat bushings to make sure the throat bushings are not uh, bad. Uh, you know, if you if you got any questions about some ways you could, during an outage and a field day where you can't change a pump, you can cheat some of these things, we'd be glad to address that with you. If you shoot us an email, we'd, we'll talk to you about how you can kind of cheat around this stuff in, in uh, some uh, outage situations because we have a great deal of experience for that. But also check your gland for wear. It's important that gland uh, fit the way it's supposed to because that's what actually transfers the load through the rings to the bottom of the stuffing box to get the packing to expand, expand to actually seal. So that gland condition is, is really important that you check that. And if you got bad glands, those things need to be replaced or, 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 or 
repaired or whatever you need to do to get that thing to a correct situation. So you, you get the reliability that you expect out of the product. Flush water environmental controls. We talked a little bit about this earlier about having about, about flush water and maintenance of flush water. This is a typical arrangement that we use a great deal for installing flush uh, services on pumps. Uh, if you look at that typical cutaway there, that, that bottom valve that goes into the pump, uh, that's where you control your, your uh, flow rates on the discharge side. Uh, of that piping and the, the top valve up there by the gauge is where you actually throttle the water, the fluids back and you flush water back to get the pressures up to that 15, 20 PSI with that stuffing box pressure. And as far as water, we don't want volumes of water, we want pressures. And the secret to it is the, the discharge flow out of that discharge line shouldn't be a half inch or a three eighth stream of water. It should be just a trickle and put your hand under it to where it feels like it's transferring heat. That's the whole secret behind it. We're looking for pressures. We're not looking for volumes of water. Gland loading. We, we talked a little bit about gland loading and, and let, me, let me talk to you a little bit about what that means and how that works. So you've got a typical packing gland here. This is one half of a stuffing box and you got ring one, two, three, four, five, six, seven there in that, in that drawing. Well, what happens typically with gland loading? You know, we talked a lot about density. Well, every everything, every product that you put in that stuffing box has got a density. And what happens when you apply gland pressure behind ring number one? The same loading is not the loading is not the same as it is on ring number seven. To get that load to transfer through that set, every ring in sequential order has to change density. In other words, it becomes harder. It becomes has more density to get the next ring to expand. Uh, so all the rings don't do the same amount of work. Typically, if you this illust this illustrates what happens if you just put the rings in and push them in with the gland and push them in with the lantern ring and you try to initially uh, apply gland load without properly seating the rings in the stuffing box. So in most cases, when you do that, about 70% of that total sealing force comes from that first two rings. And you can see how uh, uh, this graph actually shows how that loading is, is reduced when you go down to the ring set. And for you guys that have packed a lot of pumps, y'all probably seen this in the field where you have uh, the first two rings behind the gland will be burnt glazed and the bottom rings have done nothing. They look brand new. Well, the reason is, remember, that ring's a 30 second smaller than that, than that cross section that you're putting it in. In theory, probably what has happened in those cases is those first two rings try to do all that work. You burn them up trying to make them do all that work because of the excessive gland load you put on them, and the bottom rings never did anything. They never, you never you did get a pressure drop across that. So what you want to do if you properly seat the rings is flatten that curve and to get those bottom rings to function and do what they're supposed to do when you apply gland pressure. One of the things that we recommend you do is you use some sort of seating tools to properly load each ring. So what you're doing when you do that, and anybody in the packing business will tell you to seat the rings. Well, one thing to tell you to seat the rings, but it's another thing to tell you how to seat the rings and what's going on. Uh, what you're doing when you seat the rings, the best packing sets that you can buy are diaphone rings, but users do not have new equipment. True diaphone rings we make in the plant fit something that's brand new. Maintenance does not have brand new equipment to deal with. They have stuff that has sleeve wear, stuffing box wear. You have shafts that aren't centered. Uh, so I can't really make a diaphone ring to fit your stuffing box. Uh, you have to make that diaphone ring in the field. And that's the reason it's important to seat that seat each ring as you load it. What that does, that transfers that load and that, uh, that gland load across the rings more effectively. It, and it also it also it, it increases your packing life when you do that. It decreases your wear. It'll actually redu reduce your flush water use and your and your and your uh, dilution rates 
by actually loading the rings and loading them properly because you don't have that 30 second gap around the ring in the bottom of the stuffing box. Everything is, every ring is doing its job. Uh, we got a, about three videos here we want to show you. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Laurie and let her play these videos for you. But uh, this kind of illustrates you know, the proper seating of rings and what goes on with, when you seat the rings. But what you're doing when you do this, you're actually making a diaform ring that fits your particular application, which it gets no better than that. So Laurie. Uh, yes, I am about to start the first video right now. Here we go. This is a little, this is the longest one. The seated system works as follows. Included in the seated kit are spacers of various cross sections in two and four foot lengths. These spacers are cut to shaft size and used as an extension of the gland follower to properly load and expand each packing ring during installation. To use the seated system, simply lubricate and install the packing rings as you would normally. Notice that each seated spacer is the equivalent of two packing rings and three packing rings in width. For the first two rings installed, use both spacers for a total of five rings in width. Install your gland follower and tighten the gland bolts down to 35 to 40 foot-pounds torque. This expands the packing ring properly, creating a seal. You must use the gland bolts to apply proper load. Repeat the process utilizing the required seated spacers as needed. Okay, Chuck, do you have anything to add about that before we move to the next one? No, I'm, I'm good. That's uh, pretty much kind of explains what we're doing there. All right, and this is step number two, or video number two. Between the seated and unseated rings, the seated ring joints are much tighter and squared. This is part of the process of fitting the rings to your stuffing box, compensating for sleeve and stuffing box wear and off-centered shafts. As you install the fourth ring, notice how the gap between the packing ring closes and squares. This compression force only allows this ring to fill the space between the sleeve and the box bore. Don't worry about over compression, as the packing ring will relax and over compression is not possible. All right, and we're going to move on to the next one unless you have something to add, Chuck. No, that's, that's great. All right, last video, guys. When installing the final ring, use the same installation process. Loosen the gland bolts after compression allowing the packing set to recover and relax. After about three to five minutes, tighten the gland bolts finger tight and then two flats. Establish flush water flow and pressure at 15 to 20 PSI above stuffing box pressure and adjust the gland bolts one flat at a time until the external leakage rate is 10 to 20 drops per minute per inch of shaft size. I'm going to turn the presentation back over to you, okay. Chuck, and um, All right. you can, I say I'm going to. <laughs> there you go. Okay, let me get down to where I was.
Okay, shaft deflection. Oh, there you go. Let's see where I'm at. There we go. Shaft deflection. Uh, shaft deflection is a real common issue with mixers and agitators. Not so much in a pump, but uh, uh, it can happen in a pump, but it's uh, very common in mixers and agitators. And what what you in, what you're ending doing is actually having liquid actually pushing the shaft out of alignment and out of center of the stuffing box. And it could be from a huge prop that's on a mixer or be running a pump dead in deadhead conditions. And we, uh, and one of the, what happens when you do that is, you know, the packing is not, uh, the recoverability of some yarns is not that great. So there's not a spring effect. Some people make packing that has, uh, uh, rubber compounds in the middle of it to, to try to, to compensate for this deflection action. Uh, one of the things that you can do is, uh, uh, and what happens is once the packing is compressed in an area, the recovery of it, because you're getting a constant rotation and compression and release of that yarn, the recovery is not that great. So you still end up with these leak paths. So, and so the, the best thing to do with those applications is uh, uh, some sort of bushing system that supports the shaft. This, these bushings are made from uh, high strength polymers and bearing grade polymers that they actually do, do this supporting to control this run out. Uh, typically, this is typical what you see in these applications and the people that have these, these sort of systems. Some of the best ones have removable lantern rings where you can field service them. If you don't use removable lantern rings, you end up with all sorts of issues as far as maintenance. Uh, you can't uh, clean lantern rings, you'll end up with cracks in the lantern rings and, and you'll lose your bushing system. So uh, it's better if you can use one of these systems that actually uses uh, uh, lantern rings that are removable. Uh, due to the clearance in these items, that, uh, these bushing material, these bushing materials, these bearing materials, you, you, you get a substantial reduction in flush water usage. You actually get an increase in flush water velocity because you're closing that space up and you're pushing that water through there at that pressure. So you actually get a, like a washing effect to help keep those, those bottom areas clean. Uh, so, it, and of course, it does provide shaft stability, and they're usually made from these low coefficient bearing grade polymers, so it doesn't affect your power consumption. And when you lose a couple of rings of packing and, and the packing set, you can uh, actually reduce that power usage. And so that we're at the end of a, the uh, this webinar today, and uh, if y'all have any questions, uh, feel, please feel free to email me or, or or contact our staff here at SEPCO, and uh, we'd be glad to help you any way we can. So we thank you for attending today. Awesome, thanks, um, Chuck. Can you, you turn your video camera on. Uh, I'm not all by myself. Let's see. <laughs> um yeah there we go um we, we do go. have some questions that have come through so we've got about 12 minutes to to finish to to answer anything else so if you have any questions feel free to go ahead and um, ask as well um first question we have um it's on my other monitor so sorry i'm looking away from the camera um can we do a ceramic coating on the sleeve or shaft to avoid gland marks and prevent leakage sleeve coatings are a a uh a little bit of a touchy subject and there's the quality of sleeve coatings uh, between various manufacturers is sometimes questionable. You can do that, but also be aware that when you put the coatings on the sleeve and you applying frictional heat there for the packing, uh, you've got to be sure you use a good quality vendor that does that because uh, you get a different expansion of the metal that's in the sleeve versus the coating and you can come up, come have delamination issues with those coatings. And if those coatings de delaminate, uh, those become like little tungsten carbide or ceramic razor blades in your packing set, and they can really do more damage than they can than they can help. Hardened sleeves is is more of a co common solution to that. Uh, 
and we see a lot of hardened sleeves in the paper industry and uh but you just got to make sure that the the vendor that that does the coating is is a good quality vendor that that uh can make sure the coating stay on Great, thanks. Um, next question is, and, and you answered this, but I want to just go ahead and ask so we can clarify. Um, should the packing be cut at a 45 degree or 90 degree angle? It really does not matter whether you cut it on a, a scythe cut, what we call a 45, a 45 degree cut, or, or a butt cut. Uh, the main thing is that there be material in that space when you put the packing ring in. Uh, to make sure that you that you get proper loading of the ring to the bottom of the box. What happens when you don't have material in that space is you lose compression because air has no density. You lose compression of that ring along that surface, along that shaft, uh, all the way to the bottom of the box because there's no way to load the packing. There's nothing there to load to. And say, for instance, if you cut a leave a one eighth inch gap in five rings. That's five eighths inch of the surface of that shaft that has no sealing device on it. I mean, it, the 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 fluid leaks along the shaft because there's no compression of the the, the product there. So it's just really important. It's, it's, how you cut it's not important. It's more important that it fills the box. Okay. Um, next question is, and this is a good one because we did not cover this. Um, when the packing is inserted into the stuffing box, should the cut mark position be 12 o'clock or three o'clock? And I think another question is, should should the, you alternate where they are? It, it, you can, yeah, you should alternate them. Uh, where you start really does not matter. Uh, just as long as you at least alternate the ring gaps at 90 degrees. Some people use 90 degrees, some people use 180 degrees. It's just important you just alternate the gaps. Okay, great. And another question is, what is the best all-around packing for pumping pulp? As a general rule here, uh, there's, of course, you've got two different kinds of pulp. You've got a, a brown stock and you've got a bleach stock. As a general rule here, what we run is a uh, a carbon yarn or a with uh, uh, a graphite and Teflon product in brown stock services. In bleach stock services, we uh, use a high speed white yarn. That's an expanded Teflon yarn that uses, for lack of better terminology, it's white graphite. And uh, and it it uh, handles those type yarns. If you use the right white yarns, uh, those yarns handle up to about 3,300 feet per minute, which uh, most typical white yarns only handle about 1,800 feet per minute. So white yarns is where you really get in trouble uh, because of the speed limitations of them. Just pick you one that's got good speeds. And why why do you use white? This may be a stupid question. I'm asking this. Uh, the white is because they, they get concerned about migration of okay. the graphite into, into the pulp. Great. Um, what is the best packing for black liquor? Black liquor, what we, we typically use here is a carbon yarn uh, in combination with an expanded uh, graphite Teflon is what we use. Uh, we like to use... Uh, you know, one, one of the things you, that, that you really, that, that you, you know, there's some yarns will do certain things and some yarns have good characteristics and bad characteristics. And we, uh, I, I like to recommend a lot of packing sets that use a combination of different styles of packing that as long as they have good shaft speed ratings and compatible shaft speed ratings and they have good pH ratings have compatible pH ratings. I don't try to put a lesser yarn with a better yarn because you're you're only as strong as the weakest link. So okay. Um so do you, does your company have a product to help with the proper installation like a seating tool or something like that? Yes we we have for several years uh sold and marketed uh, what we call our seated system. And it's a very convenient, efficient way to fabricate and have seating tools. 
on the job to do these job to to do to do these repairs. Uh, you know, you're not out trying to fabricate things. You're not looking for things. You know, when you're on these jobs, efficiency is the important thing, and to have materials on hand that you can access efficiently, and uh, and, and make seating tools is what's really important. All right. Um, how do you avoid making the packing too tight and causing shaft wear? Shaft wear is not from being too tight because the yarns are not as strong as the metals. Uh, what you don't want to do when you when you talk about being too tight, uh, when you put the packing in, you properly seat it. You know you basically put a very light gland load on it. Uh, if you'll do that, uh, you won't end up with any sleep wear because if you over tighten the packing, you'll burn and glaze it. And when you burn and glaze the packing, the packing becomes uh, on the surfaces along the shaft becomes harder than the, uh, the rest of the body of the packing and you change the density. And when you start trying to control leakage from something, you change the density like that, you can't get enough gland load on it because the whole body of the packing has got to get, to get that hard to get it to move. So you end up with excessive sleeve wear from over tightening it. Okay. Um, and what equipment in your opinion is the toughest to seal with packing? Well, my history of course been the pulp and paper industry. Uh, the, the toughest, applications that you're going to find to seal with packing are big mixers and uh, big pulp mill equipment because you know you end up with things that are not centered they mechanically have run out uh, you know those type of applications that have huge props on them you know in the paper industry you'll have you know some of the digester equipment has you know 15 foot 16 foot props that you're trying to hold with a shaft Things with with shaft deflection is one of the most difficult things that you have to deal with. Okay, um, we have one more question. I don't know if it's serious or not, and then we can wrap up. Um, who will win the college football playoffs this year? Well, I have an idea who that one came from. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have to say, roll tide. Roll tide. <laughs> <laughs> we apologize to everyone who are not Bama fans on the call. Um, awesome. Well, that's our last question. We're almost out of time anyway. So we are going to um, wrap up. Remember that you will receive an email with the webinar recording and a link to download the, um, the slides. And under the handout section on the right hand side of the app, there are two handouts that you can download now. And if you have any questions, Chuck's email address is chucktt at sepco.com. And you can reach out to us at any time. And thank you for joining us on our inaugural uh, Silconet Classroom webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. And um, we will um, hopefully see you next month when our webinar will be about lubrication reliability, April 13th, 11 a.m. Um, remember, every second Tuesday of the month is when we're going to be doing our classroom webinars. So thanks for joining us, and we hope you all have a great day, and hopefully soon we'll all be in spring weather. Thanks. Thanks, y'all.